may be seated. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I'd like to ask you to go ahead and turn back to the book of James with me one more time. And if you are not Wi-Fi dependent this morning, if you have a cell signal, you can scan this code on the screen on either side of me and it will hopefully pop open your Bible app and you'll be able to follow the notes there. We are working in the olden times this morning. Don't, know, don't even know what it's like without the Wi-Fi. We don't, we don't know what to do. So hopefully everything will stay working. The lightning won't strike and the power won't go out. I was a little worried earlier when that one big one hit, but we've made it. We've made it this far. So James chapter one, we're gonna start in verse 26 and we're gonna read all the way into chapter two, verse 13. So if you've got that, if you're around where I'm at, we're just gonna go ahead and read and it'll also be on the screen to follow along there. So James writes, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that, our God, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? but you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do, do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we're going to pick that apart and we're going to come back through that here in a little bit. But I want to ask you a different track question that goes along the same lines. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. You'll figure it out. What motivates your purchases? I you to think about that real quick. What motivates you to buy the things you bought, whether it was a house, whether it was a car, whether it was a, a, a fishing pole? Maybe, Tim, you found some special peanut butter and you bought it, whatever it is. Um, what motivates you to, to purchase things? You know, businesses study um, consumer motivations. They, they, they study it very heavily. Do you know why they do that? So they can target their ads to you so that they can turn you from a browser into you a customer. That's, that's why they do this. They study the things that motivate why we buy things. Let's say that if you were in the market to buy something that was highly functional, you needed something that was very, very practical, well, what would they target their ads towards? Here's how you can use this car to drive your family around town. But let's say all you cared about was looking good. All you cared about was getting here to there very, very fast and very, very shiny. How would they market their car? Wouldn't you look amazing driving this car? You know, they, they target their ad sales based on what motivates you as a consumer. I don't know how you do your shopping. If you have ever run into me at Kroger or Walmarts, I do all of mine on Mondays. That, that's when I do it all for the whole week. My only incentive is to get in here and out of here as fast as possible by spending as little money as possible to make sure that my kids get all the food they need for the week. And then I'm making three or four more trips throughout the rest of the week too because it's never, it's never enough. And maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just Mr. Cheapskate up here. Um, but but that's, that's just how I roll. There was a man who once told a story about buying an engagement ring for his soon-to-be wife. He wants to ask the big question. He wants to be engaged and he was determined to find what he considered to be the best possible diamond ring before he popped the question. So he did his homework. He gets online, he does the research, he tries to find out what makes a diamond of a certain quality and what makes a diamond maybe not as good. And they say when it comes to diamonds, there's those four C's, right? You know what those are? Uh, cut, color, clarity, and carrots. 
There's not a fifth one, which I would add in, which would be cheap. And Cassie's not here this morning, so don't check on that um, with, with her, okay? Don't, don't check on her with that. But he wanted to make sure that he found the best ring possible, but also within his budget constraints. So he finds himself at a friend of the family's pawn shop. And he's in the pawn shop, and he's looking at all of these rings, and he's looking at them. He's like, this one looks like a good quality. This one doesn't look like such a good quality. But, you know, you can't really tell a diamond ring unless you get it under a microscope or you're wearing one of those, what, those fancy little jewelry eyepieces that they, they wear. And so he buys the ring, pops the question, everything goes according to plan, and he's feeling good about himself. And he actually finds out that he should be feeling really good about himself because when they go to an actual jeweler as this newly engaged couple to buy their new wedding bands, the jeweler inspects her ring and says, you almost stole this thing from the pawn shop. You got such a good deal on this. But he didn't tell this story to brag on himself for how well he came at, at, at buying a diamond ring. No, he said that the reason he shared this story was the decision-making process. He said when he was looking at the rings, it wasn't so much just picking something of a best quality when you pick something, say you're going in a store, you're looking for a house, you're looking for a car, whatever it is, we are also saying no to what? Things that we consider to be lesser quality. We may buy something because it has a certain brand name. We may have somebody build something for us because we trust the way they manufacture or the way they build. We may do all of these things because we attach a certain level of quality while also pushing aside things that are of lesser quality. How often do we, and I, I want to ask this this morning, how often do we, whether we do it consciously or whether we do it subconsciously, how often do we do the same with people? How often do we write people off after a quick first glance? How often do we maybe just get an assessment of somebody just by the way we, we look at them? You know, sometimes we call it intuition. If you're super spiritual, maybe you call it discernment. And you say, well, well, God nudged me and told me not to be around this person. Maybe you're walking down the street. Maybe you're walking through the aisle at a grocery store. Maybe you're just seeing somebody as you're driving along. And in a few seconds, what have we done? We've labeled them. We, we, we've assessed them. That person's dressed nice. That person, uh, maybe they put their carts back in the cart return. And so that person is very, very blessed. Um, maybe they're driving a nice car. And so we have this certain image of these people. But maybe they're not dressed as nice. Maybe we've seen them on one of those people at Walmart tumblers or something like that, you know? Maybe, maybe we've seen, seen them like that. Maybe their cart is just kind of leaned up over on the curb and you had to move it to get into your space. And that person is maybe not as blessed. But we make assessments about people based on all of these outward things over and over and over. You know, we don't just do it on cars. We don't just do it on clothing. And I, I really don't just do it on people's carts at grocery stores. I really don't. But we do it on all sorts of things. We do it on hair. We do it on skin color. Uh, we, we, we do it on people's facial expressions. We do it on people's body language. We do it with the way we see people carry themselves, the way they walk, the way we talk if we even hear them. Maybe we do it based on the state of their house or the state of their yard. And I mowed three yards yesterday because I was really, really behind in my mowing. And I know my neighbor across the road from me that mows twice a week was giving me the evil eye all week long. But we judge people based on all of these outward things. Is that what we're supposed to be about? Is that what we're supposed to be about? You know, most everyone makes the same snap judgments about people because that's the way the world operates. But I want you to remember something. We've been learning something different through these past three weeks and now into this fourth week in the book of James. When, when life of, of faith and, and when the life in this world collide together, we are supposed to respond differently. What has James taught us? We are to consider trials pure joy that's not the way the world operates. Uh, we, we're to pray for God's wisdom as opposed to trusting our own. We are to see things from God's perspective instead of just trusting our eyes. We don't let anger control and consume us. This is different than the way of the world. And if the way of the world is making snap judgment based on outward appearance, is the way of Jesus something different? It seems that James is telling us here that the way we speak, the way we receive people or welcome people, the way we talk to people, the way we think about people, the way we act towards other people, it is important for the believer to get this right. You know, James is writing a very practical book to us. He's letting us know what the life of faith on an everyday level is supposed to look like. Now, whether the distinctions we make in our lives, and maybe you know in your life where those distinctions lie, 
Maybe there's something subtly within your life where you know that maybe there are certain things that trigger you. It can be economic. It can be religious. Sadly, in today's day and age still, it can be racial. It can be political basis. Whatever it is, we can find that we can treat people different because they're different or even because they can't do anything for me. <laughs> so we treat them different. Let's jump back in real quick. James chapter 1. Let's finish out chapter 1, just 26 and 27. I know we read this last week, but we got to backtrack. Those who consider themselves religious and do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And James brings this out here, and we're looking at it one more time because he contrasts a religion that is worthless with the religion that he says here that God our Father accepts is what? It's pure and it's faultless. And what is it? It's to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's the religion that is pure and faultless that God accepts, that looks after the vulnerable and that remains unstained from the world around it. Now, on the surface, we may hear a passage like this and we may think, well, well what has this got to do with me? I'm not living in like... Charles Dickens, London, and there's orphans running up just trying to beg everything from me. Sir, may I have some porridge or something, you know, something like that. Um, maybe that's just my thoughts of Dick, Dickensian London. Um, but, but maybe we don't think that this applies to us. But if we would dig a little deeper in our hearts and minds, if we would really take an honest assessment of our lives, there are some subtle ways that we play favorites. The point that this passage is trying to get across and what James is trying to sell us that it's much bigger than what we might consider to be this thing called favoritism that he puts in the Bible. You see, what James is really concerned about is that we don't think of ourselves more highly than we should. Because if we do think of ourselves and put ourselves on this pedestal and then we start looking at others who are like us and we elevate them to this pedestal beside us, maybe just a little lower, <laughs> then we will neglect the people around us who are in need. And we will neglect to care for those people who truly need the kind of help that God has designed the church to give. You see, this is the church that God is after. One that finds ways to take care of, James says, those who are most vulnerable. And in the first century, it were the widows and it were the orphans who were among the most vulnerable of the society. They were vulnerable socially. They were vulnerable economically. And another thing they were, that they had not stacked in their favor in the eyes of the world in that day, they could do nothing to return an offer of kindness to them. If people were to give them kindness, there was nothing that would be given in return. It would have to be given with no strings attached. And that means you help when help is needed. That means you be present in the mess. That means you open an ear to listen. Uh, to listen. You open a home if you are called to do so. And you do it knowing that there may be nothing that comes to you in return for doing this kind of stuff. And James said that's what pure and faultless religion looks like. That's the kind of religion that God the Father accepts. It's not, as he contrasted it with last week, a worthless re religion. It does good for another person and it respects nothing in return. It picks up a fallen brother or sister without saying, how did you get yourself in this mess? Clean yourself up and then I'll come help you because I don't want to get my hands dirty. This is the kind of thing that God is after for the church. And I want you to understand, this is not based on the fact that we are inherently good in and of ourselves. This is not based on the fact that, 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 that maybe um, we're being guilt tripped by James here into doing this stuff. This is based on the character and nature of God himself. And it's a thrust of scripture that this is who our God is. Consider something like Psalm chapter 68 verse 5 where God is described as a father to the fatherless. Who are those? The orphans. He is also a defender of widows. This is God in his holy dwelling. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 brings it full circle to Jesus in the New Testament. It says that God, this God who is a father to the fatherless, a God who is a defender of widows, he also demonstrates his own love for us. Each and every person that while we were still sinners, and we hear that word, but we don't sometimes think of the weight of it. This means that when we were sinners, when we were guilty, when we were rebellious, when we were the worst of the worst, God sent Jesus to come to this earth and to die for us. We were the vulnerable. We were the needy. We were those who were on the outside looking in. We are the spiritual orphans who were brought into the family of God through Jesus Christ. James says orphans and widows specifically, but he's talking about all those who are vulnerable. He's talking about all those who are neglected. He says, take care of these people because that's who you were before Christ took care of you. 
That's who you were before Jesus brought you in to the family of God. You know, who are these people today? Who out there does not know a person who is in a mess today? <laughs> Maybe you're feeling the weight of that this morning. We all know people in our lives who need to be looked after. We all know people in our lives who their lives are just a mess, even if it's of their own doing. Now, I do want to say this. We don't perpetuate and we don't affirm someone's poor choices, but we come alongside them because we don't completely give up on them either. We come alongside them and we share the love of Jesus Christ and we meet them where their needs are the greatest. And throughout generations, people have asked, well, what does God want from me? How does God want me to live for him? And James focuses on nothing other than saying, care for the orphans, care for the widows, and then don't be stained by the pollution of this world. That's what he says God is after. That's what he says God is about. You see, a right relationship with God will be evident by right relationships with other people. The people sitting next to you, but also extending out from there wherever we find ourselves. In our schools, in our workplaces, in our community. Our lives are to be kept also from being polluted by the world, James says. One of Jesus' disciples, a guy by the name of John, he wrote his own letter to the church. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says this. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. You know, John's not talking about the world of nature. Don't love the trees. Don't love the rocks. Hate the rocks. Take that, whales. No, it's not what he's talking about. He, he, he's talking about the values and the systems and the patterns of this world that are in opposition to, that are rebelling against God's intent and design. So once again, pure and faultless, unpolluted religion is the polar opposite of worthless religion. And I want to tell you, we have probably witnessed, and maybe we've fed into it at times before, some worthless religion. Hear me out. <laughs> Hear me out. It's a religion that, that wants to only manage what? The outward appearance. It's a religion that only wants to give lip service to good things, but never does what? Anything. It's a religion that is constantly in a mode of us versus them and never offers any solutions to all of the vast problems that we are quick to point out in the world around us. James says we're not just to do good to the vulnerable around us, but we are also once more to stay unpolluted. Or maybe your translation, I'm not sure what you're reading in this morning, it says unstained from the world. What if our church is sought to do both of those things? Care for the needy and be unstained from the world. Not just wall ourselves off from the world, but carrying the name of Jesus, the light of Jesus, the love of Jesus with us wherever we go. What if people who never gave a second thought to giving their lives to Jesus could see the beauty and the power of his grace and his love through who? Through us. What if they could see that? Would people not be drawn to something like that? Not just to the church, but to the Jesus who does these things through us. Far too often we are so concerned with keeping ourselves unstained and unpolluted from the things of this world that all we do is sit back and we point fingers at all of the things that might stain and pollute. We complain about the lack of this. We complain about the abundance of that. But we are not willing sometimes to step out of our own little Christian bubbles <laughs> and into the life of someone who truly needs Jesus. Is that what Jesus did for us? Philippians chapter 2 says, we are not to look to our own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. I'll take a drink for a second. I'm sorry. Struggling right here. <laughs> you know, if Jesus can look at the messes that we have made of our lives and the mess that we have made of this world because of our sin, and he can lay aside his glory to come and step into this world, to walk in it, to walk among it, and to die to save it then shouldn't we be able, church, to, when needed, go out of our way to love, out of our way to serve, out of our way to point other people to this Jesus and the claim that he has on their lives? Shouldn't we be able to do that? 
you know, we can't go too far one way or the other. We can't be a church that just constantly swings back and forth. And that's what the American church has done far too often. We've swung from one side to the other. You know, just as there are churches who have swung way too far into walling themselves off from the church or from the world around them, there are other churches that have swung all the way over where you can't even see a difference in their lives and the life of the world. They're not standing on, on, on the truth. They're all grace and no truth and not blending it together like God would have us to do. There are so many who can start concerned with only doing good in this world that they've adopted the beliefs and the patterns and the practices of the world around them. And I want to tell you, the one that walls itself off and the one that uh, just assimilates completely to the culture, both of those are what James would describe as worthless religion. They just have different labels on them. There's a better way. And it is the way of following Jesus to willingly minister to the brokenness of the world, but we do so without being stained by the world. We love without compromise from a place of uncompromised grace and truth. You see, grace and truth cannot be separated from one another. They can't be separated from one another because along with love and along with justice, they are the very heart and they are the very character of who God is. And I imagine once more if a church would live this out that we could see people as God sees them, that we would get past our snap judgments of what somebody looks like on the outside and realize that this person was made in the image of God and no matter what they are doing with that image, they still bear the image of God. What if we could do that as a church? What if no matter what, this identity that people are fashioning for themselves, what if we still show them love and grace and welcome? But at the same time, we stood firm on the truth of God. That God has a design for this life. And he's called us to live it. That it's who God says we are that matters. It's God's identity being recreated and refashioned and restored within us in the image of his son, Jesus Christ. That is what we are to be about. You see, we need to be committed to both of those things as a church. We are called in this day and age to be as radical and as countercultural as Jesus was, but we do it with radical grace, radical truth, and radical love. This is what we do as a church. So what does it mean to keep ourselves unpolluted from the world? It means to keep yourself from being stained. You know what a stain is, right? We deal with stains in our house constantly. My kids don't know how to eat. They play too many sports. <laughs> And so it's always grass stain, food stain, dirt stain, and yes, the occasional blood stain because Will slides head first all the time. And Chase, we've talked to him about this, but he gets these little things right here and he just bleeds all over his stuff. Come on, you're 15 now. Get it together. Get it together, man. Um, <laughs> there was a family who, who talked about what, what, what they were vulnerable to being stained in in their lives. And the guy said it was spaghetti. That was just really quickly what he said. It was spaghetti. He said when they ate spaghetti at home that his boys were young. I mean, mine are 15 and, and 12. I mean, they still get stuff all over. But he said their, their kids were young. And so when they ate spaghetti at home, what they did was instead of just having to wash shirts all the time, they would sit and eat their spaghetti shirtless at the table. <laughs> now, he said when they would go out in public that they just wouldn't order any sauce on the spaghetti for their kids because they didn't want to be like, well, that's that weird family. <laughs> that sits with their shirts off at the table. Uh, but he said what he realized was that you have to understand what you're vulnerable to being stained by in this world. You have to understand what you're vulnerable to being polluted by in this world. And what are some of the things in this world that we might be vulnerable to? What are some of the things in this life that, that might stain us? Well, relationships can be a vulnerability. We were created to exist in relationships with God and with one another. But sometimes there are relationships where if that's all we know and we're emotionally dependent on this person or that person or that group or this group, you see what can happen is we can adopt their worldviews and we're not being matured in the word of God and we're not adopting God's worldview. We can be vulnerable in the area of our relationships. Well, I'm friends with this person and they believe this. Maybe that's what I got to believe. They're going hard after this. Maybe I got to go hard after that too. There may be some relationships in this life where we have to mature in Christ before we step into those relationships, sometimes wholeheartedly. I know that's tough in a message where we're trying to meet needs and love one another. But relationships in our lives, we need to realize whether maybe some of those can be a vulnerability. Another one, I'm not going to spend too much time on this this morning because this is an election year. But politics, 
can be something that stains us and pollutes us from this world. No matter which side of the aisle you are on, when all that is being talked about is fear, when all that is being talked about is hatred of the other, whoever the other is at the moment, we can get so caught up in politics that it drives us away from what God has told the church to be about. We're not to be polluted by relationships or politics. Also, there's another one, entertainment. And entertainment is a subtle one. It's a very subtle stain that can get on us and get within us. We spend and interact more with our social feeds, our social media feeds, with our TVs, with our laptops, with our iPads, with our radios, with what, I don't know, you probably don't listen to radios anymore. It's like, serious, XM, whatever. Um, I say I'm on a tangent now. Don't, don't stop me, Leo. Don't stop me. But we spend more time with that stuff than we spend with what? The Word of God. Don't give me a weird look if you don't believe me because research bears this out over and over and over and over. We have more access to the Word of God, but we spend less time in it. Entertainment can stain us. It can desensitize us. It can mind numb us to where we just think, well, that's got to be true because I'm hearing and seeing it all the time. What are you most vulnerable to? If we're to keep ourselves unpolluted and unstained from the things of this world, then we have to realize what we're vulnerable to. Now, James moves on into chapter 2, and we're going to as well. See, what James is doing when he jumps into chapter 2, it may seem like it's this unconnected thing where he jumps out of this religion for orphans and widows, and then he goes into this talk about favoritism. Well, what James has given us is an example that he has seen in the church that he is writing to of these people, how they have been polluted and stained by the world because... They're showing favoritism to people based on outward appearances. And that's what he's talking about. Let's just read it real quick. One through seven. He says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting. He's dressed nice. He's wearing a nice ring. And then a man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the one dressed in fine clothes and give him a good seat and tell this other guy to sit on the floor, have you not discriminated and become judges with evil thoughts? He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has, God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he's promised to those who love him? And once again, James is relying heavily here on the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, well, blessed are the poor. He's relying heavily on big half-brother's words. <laughs> blessed are the poor, that you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? So there is no room for, for, for favorites in God's church. There's no room for favorites in God's church. There's a, there's a song, and I've read this quote before, but it says that the ground at the foot of the cross is, is level. And that means that God makes no distinctions. That means that God plays no favorites, and neither should who? Neither should we. Neither should we as the church. If we are following Jesus in the kingdom of God, then, then, then we are all worth the same no matter our, our net worth. We all have an account of riches and love and grace from God no matter what is in our other account, that, that bank account that, that, that dwindles each and every month. See, when we're playing favorites, James brings us around at the end and he's talking about mercy. When we are playing favorites, we are showing a lack of mercy to those that we are not favoring. It goes back to that idea about the diamond ring, or maybe if you're purchasing something, you want something of good quality, but you're saying no to things of lesser quality. And we do the same with people when we show favoritism. You see, God favors everyone. He loves everyone. And I know this may strike us wrong, but God loves you just as much as he loves the murderer. <laughs> God loves you just as much as he loves the fill in the blank for whatever horrible sin you can conceive of in your mind right now. Don't do it though. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die, not just for you, but for that person. See, when we are stained by sin, that's what we are. We're the worst of the worst. But James says if we're showing favorites based on any outward standard that we are not following the ways of Jesus. And you would like to think that we in the church are immune to this sort of stuff, but I would advise us all to think again. You may be familiar with the name uh, Chuck, Chuck Colson. 
um, Charles or Chuck Colson, whatever you, you want to call him. I don't know if you're friends with him or not. Um, you call him Chuck just on the side. But he was a former um, political advisor to then President Richard Nixon. You know, Colson had a big hand in the Watergate scandal. He was like one of the political masterminds behind Nixon's presidency. And he ended up actually serving time in prison where he, um, he, he, he really got solid in his faith. He founded Prison Fellowship. He wrote several books uh, about Christianity and about conflict. And in one of his books, it's called... Um, Kingdoms in Conflict. And it's amazing to me that he calls it kingdom in conflict because the kingdoms he's writing about are the kingdom of God and the kingdom of government. And uh, he, he wrote that when he was in Nixon's White House, they would host all of these parties in the White House to try to court favor with political allies. And they would bring in all of these leaders from around the, the nation. They'd bring in business leaders. Uh, they would bring in just uh, local leaders like governors or senators or things like that. And they would also bring in religious leaders. And what they would do, they would throw this huge party at the White House and they would give give them all this food, all this drink. They would just be having all of this fun time. And they'd be like, hey, do you want a tour of the White House? And they'd take this tour of the White House. Hey, do you want to see the Oval Office? Do you want to see where the magic happens in the president's office? And they would go in the Oval Office and it just so happened that the president would wander in and he would come in and he would start shaking hands and telling jokes and being all happy with them. And he would give each person that came in there a special pair of gold cufflinks that had the presidential seal on it. I mean, it's kind of, kind, of, kind of a cool thing that you would get from the president. And by the end of the evening, the people that they brought in and they glad handed and they shook hands, kissed babies, all of that sort of stuff. These people would then become political allies of the president because of the way they had been treated when they were in the Oval Office. Now, Colson adds, <laughs> he says, ironically, this is straight from the book. He says, ironically, none were more compliant than the religious leaders. Of all people, they should have been the most aware of our sinful nature and least overwhelmed by pomp and protocol. And he says, but theological knowledge sometimes wilts in the face of worldly power. Hmm. It's just horrible to think about. It's horrible to read. You know, that's it's not what we're called to be. That's not what we're called to be about. We're not called to sacrifice our convictions. We're not called to sacrifice our grace or our truth in an effort to core power and an effort to gain power or in an effort to exert power over another. Think about Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 13, when we read this passage of scripture, just before Jesus is about to be arrested and crucified, just before he gets up and begins washing his disciples' feet, in John chapter 13, we're told that Jesus knows that the Father has put all power in his hands. And what does Jesus choose to do with it? He kneels down and he washes the feet of one who is about to betray him. He washes the feet of, of Peter, who he knows very soon will go out and deny that he even knows him. This is what Jesus chooses to do, wash feet and die on a cross. You see, Jesus knew how to wield power correctly. We, who still have some of that fallen nature within us, who are still being recreated and restored and remade in the image of Jesus Christ, power is something for us to be weary of. Power is something for us that, that like money, that like resources, that can lead us to doing things that we wouldn't normally do. Power, money, and resources, when used wrongly, can lead us to, to sin. You see, the more power we have and the more we try to hold it over somebody else, the more our sinful tendencies can come out in an effort to exert that power, in an effort to hold on to that power. I've seen it time and time again, and this is not anything to do with any of you people or any people you know. So take it for this. I've seen it time and time again where even the most well-meaning and well-intentioned Christian people, when you threaten their power and when you threaten their leadership, you better watch out because that's when it really gets real. James is saying, you shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't live your life like this. You see, we as a church are to be a gospel-shaped community. We're to be a community of people that, 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 that exist and live for grace and truth. We are to have a different ranking system than the ranking systems of the world and how it likes to play favorites. No matter what a person looks like, no matter how a person dresses, no matter how a person smells or what car they drive, we're all on the same level playing field. But it is so hard to live this way because we are so easily caught up in appearances and we are so easily caught up also and wanting to know what can you do for me if I do this for you. 
And James goes on. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, and once again, he goes back to Jesus. What did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? Love God with all heart, soul, mind, strength, and to love who? Your neighbor as yourself. And it's the royal law now because Jesus ushers in the kingdom and Jesus is King Jesus. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Remember freedom from last week. We talked about freedom. We like to think that freedom is just um, being free from all restraints and free from all restrictions. But what true freedom is, is living the way Jesus would have us live. And it's learning to live with the right restraints on life and in the right guardrails for how God has designed life best to live. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, mercy is not just giving somebody um, what they don't deserve. Mercy is also reaching out and helping somebody in, in their time of need. The exact word here for mercy, it actually means kindness or goodwill. And I want you to catch this. Kindness or goodwill towards the miserable. <laughs> kindness or goodwill towards the afflicted. And it's also joining them where they are with the desire to help them. That's what mercy is. It's what mercy according to the Bible is. You see, if we want mercy, then we are to show mercy. And it all comes down to the foundation of love. Love is the foundation for why we do these things. Love is the foundation for why we look at people and don't play favorites. Love is the foundation for why we look at the vulnerable and we want to help them. Love is what keeps us unstained from the world because we love God so much and he loved so much that he sent Jesus to bring us out of that. It comes down to love. And I want to tell you, that's not the kind of love the world loves with. What are the relationships of love in this world based on? It's transactional. I'll do this for you. You do this for me. You make me feel this way, so I'm going to try to make you feel this way. We are supposed to love people differently. We love based on the love, the grace, and the truth of God. Now, speaking about this passage, there's a pastor by the name of Brandon Kelly. He says that a broken world doesn't need a reflection of itself. It needs an alternative to itself. That's what we are supposed to be as the church. As Trevor and Hallie get ready to come up, and, and if Zach's coming with them too, if y'all want to go ahead and come back up and get ready for a song of response. I want to tell you, this is where it gets real. This is what the church is supposed to be. We have been called by God to be set apart, to be holy, to be standing firm on God's truth. Yes, yes, yes. But we have also been called to love others wholeheartedly, and unconditionally because this is what God has done for us. You see, love doesn't ignore sin. Love also doesn't blindly celebrate sin. Love doesn't ignore people who live contrary to God's design, even if it makes us uncomfortable. Love is different. And a broken world needs a loving and thriving church that lives on the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. We do what God says. We take care of the widows. We take care of the orphans. We take care of the vulnerable. We keep ourselves unpolluted and unstained from the world. I want to say everyone has a story that they are living. Everybody. You're living a story. Maybe you think you're writing it yourself. Maybe there's some side chapters. Somebody slid in there somewhere. But everybody has a story that they are living in this life. But I want to tell you the church is supposed to have a better story. A story that says no matter your accomplishments, no matter the lack of those accomplishments, no matter uh, your beauty or lack of it, no matter whether you're able to do things really well or if you're like me and you have to go to Lowe's five times in one week to find something to fix plumbing underneath the sink. That's just me. I don't know which side of that you're on, but no matter what, you are of infinite worth to an infinite God. Whatever you've brought into this place this morning, know that you are of infinite worth to an infinite God, a God who in his infinite love <laughs> paid the ultimate price by coming down and living the life you couldn't and dying for all the times that you get it wrong. But yet in his power, 
He rose from the dead so that we could find new life even here. And now that's a better story because it's a story of grace. That's a better story because it's a story of truth. It's a better story because it is a story of love. And that can be our story. That can be your story for your life. You see, when God tells us in this life so often that there's a better way for your life, so many people hear that and they think it's restraining. They think it's something that holds them back from doing all that they want. And sometimes you know what it is. It does hold us back from doing all that we want, but God says there is a better way, the way he designed this life, the way he intended this life to be lived. And we find that through Jesus Christ. You know, sin may be temporarily exciting for a time, but what comes after? There's consequences. There's guilt, there's shame, but the life with Jesus Christ brings freedom. It brings ultimate, eternal life with him that begins the moment you believe. You know, Jesus is telling us to step into this story where we are loved radically. You know, with God, we don't have to earn anything because Jesus has freely given his life in exchange for ours. He's already earned it, but what we need to do is what? Accept it. He's earned it. We need to accept it. And you can do this this morning. We're going to close up in a time of response and singing. And you can feel free to, to, to pray this morning. Just confess where you've done your own thing. Ask him to forgive you for all of those times you've turned astray. And then tell Jesus that you will trust in him for this day and the days to come. And if you don't think you can do it, ask him for the strength to do it. And talk to someone in this place that can help be there for you as well. What would it look like for the church to live this passage from James out? What I want you to do this morning, I want you to consider these things. Remind yourself of what's true and what God says. Recognize where you're vulnerable and how to keep yourself from being polluted. And start seeing people that God places in our lives, that how we need to love them in grace and truth because you are not where you are in your life by accident. God has placed you there for a reason. And if God is leading you to pray any of these things this morning, to accept his love and grace through Jesus, to have your heart checked, to see if you're subtly playing favorites, to just ask for the strength to stand in this world, you can do that here at this altar. You can do it at any place, but if you want, you can do it here at this altar. And after we close up in a time of singing and response, if you are a believer, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, we want to invite you to take communion with us. I'm going to take the lid off of that tray in a second. You can just start coming through the center aisle and taking that. You can take it back to your seat with you. You can gather around this altar and pray and be prepared to take it. But just hold on to that cup because we will all be taking it together after we sing as a church. So go ahead and I'd like to ask you to stand. If you want to come pray, come pray. If you need somebody to pray with, don't hesitate to ask it. But come and take your communion and then take it back to the seat and we'll take it back together or stay here and pray as well.